Mike, welcome to the blockchain.com podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing quite well today. Thanks so much for having me. Great. Well, we have a tradition. Uh, we always ask our guests uh, how they earned their first dollar. What's your story there? Yes. So I grew up in a you know, small town in, in Connecticut and we moved into you know, a house that had a, a big hill in the backyard and it had a bunch of rocks on it. So when, when I was a little, you know, my dad basically said, you know, Hey, why don't you guys you know, build a, uh, you know, build in the backyard, you know, some trails, some, some rock climbing trails. I mean, this is like, you know, 20 feet high and, and we'll make a map and, you know, we'll put a, put a little table out in the, in the end of the driveway and we'll see if we can get some people to, to come by and, and go, you know, rock climbing on your 20, 20 foot backyard rock. So yeah, I think he must have you know, probably told a couple of people in the neighborhood to stop by and uh, sure enough, they did. And, and you know, we gave them the, the treasure map to, to climb the rocks and, and made a few dollars. So yeah, my dad was an entrepreneur himself and you know, family business and you know, just some good lessons there and, and making a little money uh, doing things a little out of the ordinary. That, that is definitely out of the ordinary. We, we hear like, you know, lemonade stands, farming, that, that's one of the more interesting and creative first dollars for sure. <laughs> well, that's a good lead in to, to telling us a bit more about yourself, you know, how you started your career and, and what brought you into tech and, and ultimately crypto and fintech. Yeah, so it's been a really you know, exciting journey for me. I mean, I was, I graduated uh, college, you know, into the dot-com bust. And so instead of, you know, going to Google and, and being a sales guy, I ended up at, at Disney. And, and so for the first decade of my career, worked in media and, and entertainment. So, you know, TV broadcast in, in sort of strategic planning and you know, business development and corp dev roles. And then was fortunate enough about a decade into my career to be at Google in, in a role, you know, at YouTube working you know, media and entertainment and, and Google is a great company it allows you, you know, if you have talent and you're kind of like demonstrating it to switch into something completely different. So we were launching Google wallet around that time. And the last decade has been spent, you know, working primarily in FinTech. So Google wallet, Braintree Venmo, and now Paxos, you know, founded a couple companies along the way in between. And what's really, really exciting about, you know, 2021 for me is, you know, those two worlds are really converging in a lot of ways. And, and you know, we're right in the middle of it with, with Stablecoin and Paxos, but basically you're seeing this convergence of, you know, kind of call it web three and, you know, with, which has, you know, media, entertainment, gaming, you know, mixed with FinTech and crypto primitives. So it's sort of all come full circle. Awesome. So let's talk about briefly your experience at the block, the idea for, for starting that. Where did that idea come from? And, and tell us about kind of the, the genesis and story of the block. So the you know, primary thing I've always been interested in and what I work on is emerging technologies that are you know, typically consumer facing or touch and end consumer, you know, even, if, even if it's a B2B product that I work on, like at Paxos, where the product ultimately touches the end consumer through our customer. You know, so I love to you know, bring new technology to you know, 50X, 100X the people who are aware of it. And you know, I've been interested in crypto personally since 2013 when I was at Braintree and you know, we talked about coin, with Coinbase about adding Bitcoin acceptance to the gateway for our merchants who included Uber and Airbnb. But you know, that, that never really materialized. And so I spent some time in you know, traditional commerce, started a company called Button. And then 2017, you know, crypto prices going up like that, got, got the bug again and you know, kind of looked at my stash and said, hey, this is fun. And, and then, you know, it was kind of a crazy time where you know, tokens were coming out of the woodwork and ICOs were happening. And normal people you know, started, you know, my friends started asking me about crypto because they don't. I'd been into Bitcoin for, for a number of years. So I, I quickly learned that I had no idea what the heck was going on. Like I had missed a theory at the time I was, was what you would call a Bitcoin maximalist and you know, thought it was sort of the one true blockchain and, and maybe didn't, I'm not an engineer and at the time didn't really understand some of its limitations. It has unbelievable you know, utility and, and potential, but you know, didn't understand there were going to be other blockchains. So anyway, as I you know, dug in and, and thought about, hey, I want to work on this full time, you know, ultimately... I look at you know fintech where I'd been working for a number of years at Braintree Venmo and Google Wallet as you know call it pa papering over and you know covering up the legacy financial system. You know I saw crypto as like completely you know revamping it and you know literally moving us a century forward in terms of you know financial markets and applications. So I, I thought, hey, how can I help grow this ecosystem? You know I'm not an engineer. I'm not going to build a protocol. And frankly, it was. 
every question I asked, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm very you know, social and outgoing and an extrovert and was talking with tons of people, you know, one, you know, nobody was an expert on everything. And it took big groups of people to accumulate meaningful knowledge. So, you know, I didn't feel at the time, 2018, early, late 2017, that there were great resources out there, mm -hmm. that the industry media was you know, primarily run by like, journalists and then the mainstream media literally had no clue and didn't understand you know the complexity of of crypto you know that it wasn't just technology or finance but it merged both and you know with with governance issues and a whole you know, bunch of other you know, systems thinking and so we put together a company you know i felt had a group of folks you know a mixture of researchers and journalists who could work together and, and produce you know some of the best information out there that was trustworthy and unbiased now you know it's hard to stay completely unbiased but you know again you know best faith efforts to present objective information to the world and so you know it was really exciting and and spent two and a half years doing that and and you know got to meet just incredible people and obviously the team has sort of taken the banner and, and run with it and, and continues to grow that, you know, that business. And I think educate both institutional investors as well as retail folks with really high quality information. And that's to me is one of the primitives of being able to grow this ecosystem is just having people have a basic understanding of it. And there's a long way to go on that front. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, I, we're huge fans of the block here at blockchain.com and, and as someone who personally was you know one of the early employees at Coindesk, I think the block really kind of took to kind of the research and journalism to the next level uh, and it's great to see you know more sources of reliable information kind of being developed so grateful that you stepped no, in to create that. Great that and and frankly it made i think it made coindesk better i mean i think it's a wonderful mm -hmm. product today i mean it was a good product and, and i think it's helped everyone improve and, and there are others so it, it's really exciting time in uh call it trade or focused information uh, but still a long way to go yeah, absolutely. Now you, of course, transitioned from the block to Paxos. So tell us about that story, why you yeah. did that and, and what, what attracted you to Paxos. Yeah. So, you know, I'm far enough along in my career to understand, you know, when the sort of called founder company, you know, fit isn't perfect and, you know, really value, I think, you know, as you learn about careers, careers are not linear. They're not like, you know, Hey, I'm going to do this thing. And then I, therefore I need to do this thing. I, I started to realize, you know, I've got a you know, feisty, fun, fiery personality. It's actually a really good match for, you know, quote unquote, boring technology, right? Because you can bring spice and excitement and, you know, really, really sell it. And so what happened to block is, I mean, crypto is, it's just a wild, wild ecosystem and, you know, putting my personality against, you know, in front of really, you know, you know, deep, deep, deep research objective, some of it critical, you know, hard hitting journalism and news stories, you know, it, it was basically, I, I, I ran into this issue where frankly, uh, and too much of the focus was just on, you know, not the actual work that was being done, but, you know, the personalities and the ecosystem. So one, it wasn't productive. Two, I burnt out and didn't feel like I was fulfilling the mission. And three, you know, really thought like the team, you know, with me taking sort of a step back could do it better. And, and, and they have, and they've done an incredible job, really, really great group of folks. And I have a passion, you know, so I was like, okay, well, we've started this journey and I put together a great team and they're executing on the information primitives to, you know, get folks understanding blockchain technology. You know, now I want to work for the next couple of decades on how do we actually get the technology in front of people? You know, like, hey, I know what I want to do. And stable coins weren't really a thing in 2017, or I probably would have been interested. And maybe that would have been the first thing I did because I've always been interested in crypto as you know, because of my background at Google Wallet, Braintree, Venmo, you know, for payments, you know, primarily. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 24 seven, 365, you know, secure, transparent, you know, always on global, you know, low fee payments, like that is, is the mission. And so, you know, I wanted to work on the technology and touch, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. And, and Paxos is one of the handful of companies in the world that does that. As I think about what do I love and what am I really good at? It's the, you know, again, brain trees, you know, brain tree was an enabler, you know, you know, equivalent to Stripe effectively, you know, basically enabling other companies to accept payments. No, but you don't see brain tree, right? So same thing at Paxos. So Paxos is an enabler, you know, almost like you could call it like almost like a Stripe or a brain tree for crypto. If you're a technology company, if you're a, you know, a FinTech, if you're a neobank, if you're a bank, 
and, and you want to offer crypto products to your end customers, it can be really challenging to do that alone. And Paxos, you know, and I looked around for, for a long time, you know, to me was the absolute best infrastructure provider for that. And it helped that, you know, prior to me joining, they were working with my previous company, you know, Venmo and, and PayPal. So, you know, just heard wonderful things and they're wonderful people. But uh, anyway, I don't want to make this a Paxos advertisement. No, no, that's that's what we're here to talk about because you know we've been supporting you know on our platform and our wallet you know the Paxos stablecoin for quite some time now and and so we want to introduce our customers to you and 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 help them better understand the the, the Paxos kind of infrastructure and what, what that is. So so tell us more about kind of uh, Paxos and and the stablecoin and and the whole suite of things you do. Yeah, so it, it's a great question. So our you know our. Our CEO, Charles, founded the company, you know, along with Rich Teo in, in 2012. And, you know, he, you know, prior to that had, had worked in Wall Street and finance and had, you know, had seen, you know, people having, you know, difficulty, you know, call it settling transactions. It would take multiple days. You know, there were a lot of these, like around the, you know, the financial crisis of, you know, 12, 13 years ago, having people, you know, having trouble finding collateral, unwinding trades, et cetera. And, you know, so his earliest vision, and he was very early to Bitcoin was, you know, basically blockchain technology and you know, Bitcoin being the first implementation of that, you know, has the potential to improve, you know, so many aspects of financial markets, but effectively, you know, how assets are issued, you know, how they're transferred, you know, how they're custodied, how they're settled. Okay. So Paxos focuses across multiple asset classes. So cash in the form of stable coins. You know, public cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, commodities. So we have tokenized gold and then equities. So you know, equity, security, settlement. So effectively, we work across asset classes and, and we're a regulated blockchain infrastructure company. Okay. So you, know, you name the asset type and, and we're making it our mission to ensure you know, that these assets, you know, whether they be again, cash, crypto, commodities, securities are issued you know, transferred, custodied, settled, utilizing blockchain technology. And we think over the next 20 years, a, you know, maybe the majority, you know, in 20 years from now, at some point in the future will actually exist in, you know, that, that flow I was talking about utilizing mm -hmm. blockchain technology. So it's an exciting time. And that, you know, extends as well to, to fiat money, you know, to government money in the form of central bank digital currencies. And I know that's something we'll probably discuss later. So, the you know that's the mission and you know so so it's a fun one and, and it means that we can serve our customers across asset classes right so you know let's just say you know i'm a global fintech and i want you know stable coin infrastructure i want crypto infrastructure hey maybe i want to list tokenized gold and then you know other commodity products well paxos is that platform that can do all of those things versus me having to maybe work with three or four different you know point solution providers Yep, absolutely. So you've had huge success with the stable, you know, both both PAX itself and also, you know, creating, you know, what can, maybe can be described as kind of a white label stablecoin system. Can you talk about why that's been so successful? And and also for people who are still relatively new to stablecoins, we always try to try to make sure we're, we're not leaving people behind on these. What exactly is a stablecoin and how does uh, the PAX stablecoin say differ from some of the other types out there, like the crypto collateralized or algorithmic stable coins? Yeah, great question. So, so there, there's a few different types. So stable coins ultimately are effective. They're meant to be, you know, representatives pegged to the value of you know, some, you know, some other, you know, some asset, right? So it could be you know, pegged to a dollar, you know, pegged to a Euro. And so the, a stable coin is basically meant to track the value of that, you know, pegged to some quantity of gold. So, so you know, Paxos basically issues both you know, branded versions of those. And as you mentioned, you know, white label versions. So, you know, we have infrastructure that allows us to do that on behalf of folks like Binance, for example, who has the third largest stable coin in the world by issuance over $12 billion, I believe now. And so quickly to answer your question, this types of stable coins are, are you know, fiat backed where you know, basically you know, every stable coin, call it dollar issued is backed by you know, $1 in reserves. At Paxos, you know, we keep all of those reserves in you know, cash and cash equivalents. And we don't no funny money, no funny money like backing and funny business. And you know, I think that there have been you know, pretty public questions about whether all 
you know, fiat backed stable coins are truly backed by, you know, dollars you can depend on without credit risk, not to name, you know, any specific other stable coins. So you know, we take that very seriously. We are all about, you know, the reason we've succeeded is our regulatory uh, oversight, you know, by NYDFS, by, you know, we have an OCC charter. So we're a heavily regulated Mm -hmm. entity and and you know compliance is top of mind in everything that we do and you know financial regulation having a primary regulator that's different than being licensed right so license is like a permission to do something like the bet license sure hey you have permission to do this regulated means like the regulator sets up takes on the onus of setting up the policies and procedures with you and then kind of you know checks in on those on a very regular basis making sure you're adhering to them so very very big distinction that i think people are going to be become very clear on in, in the coming months and years how mm-hmm. important that is the other types of stable coins i mean there's some wild ones so there's there's crypto collateralized you know maker is 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 primarily crypto or you know crypto collateralized where you know you have ETH and you know other cryptocurrencies that are back, you know, the stablecoin die that's issued. And then you have algorithmic stablecoins, which are meant to sort of keep that, call it one to one dollar peg through different, you know, algorithmic, you know, mechanisms. They don't have to date a very good history of, of holding their pegs. So, you know, I, I think I think for purposes of this discussion, you know, fiat backed regulated stable coins are, are likely the ones that are going to see you know, significant usage and adoption through you know the types of folks we partner with, which are banks, financial institutions, fintechs, and neobanks, because they have a responsibility you know to security of the principal value of their customers' deposits and holdings. Okay, and then yep. as we move towards who's going to partner with CBDCs, it's going to be companies like Paxos that you know work in, in this regulated fiat-backed world. Yeah, so we've been successful, and, and our product. You know, Pax itself, which is our branded stablecoin, you know, today, you know, it, it, it's it's you know basically we utilize that to develop significant expertise in you know kind of how stablecoins operate, what they're used for, you know, how they can be used in DeFi, such that we can service the the much larger in terms of scale business of Binance and and some other folks that we have coming down the pipeline who will be you know issuing you know global stablecoins. Right. And the use cases will be changing. So to date, stable coins have primarily been used in sort of an insular way for centralized and you know De- DeFi you know, trading. So decentralized finance and centralized trading by primarily you know, sig- you know, significant financial mark you know, companies like tr- trading desks and, and really sophisticated investors. But we expect literally order of magnitude increase in stablecoin usage and velocity and, and stablecoin outstanding over the next three to four years as stablecoins get into mobile wallets. You know, call it the, you know, I would envision a world where they're in the all of the mobile wallets that we have that have money, whether that's Cash App or Venmo or PayPal or Zelle or I think Novi, you know, is launching at some point, things like that. Cool. Yeah, I just want to come back to the regulated part of, of Paxos. And, and I think it was September 2018 when the New York Department of Financial Services, you know, kind of authorized both Paxos and, and Gemini at the time to, to launch their US dollar stable coins. And I think these are set up in, in trusts. And, and, and I think it's worth actually just mentioning kind of what kind of protections that trust structure creates for the users of these stable coins. So I think that's a pretty interesting structure, if I've got that correct. Yeah. So effectively, yeah, a trust bank, you know, basically, you know, we can't take those funds and then you know, rehypothecate them and, and take those deposits and, and do other things with them. Right. So it's just a, it's a, it's a very specific type of structure where you have, you know, confidence that, you know, the money deposited with the trust bank is not going to be, you know, again, it's not going to, it's not going to be subject to uh, significant cool. Yep. And, and yeah, I think one of the things back in September 2018 was, I mean, I think it was the first time a regulator actually had had kind of authorized the launching of a new cryptocurrency, which was incredibly innovative. So you guys I think deserve a lot of credit for, for your pioneering work on the, on the regulatory front. So let's let's talk about how PAX is being used. You know, today, you know, blockchain.com, our customers can earn 13.5% APY on, on their interest bearing accounts when they deposit PAX into those. That's an incredible incredible interest rate compared to what people can earn in their, their savings accounts at traditional banks. You mentioned that, you know, stable coins are being used in trading, but how, how, how are, how are PAX and PAX powered stable coins being used today? You know, are those the two primary use cases? Are there other things you're starting to see some, 
early uh, signs of broader adoption for? Yeah. So the ones that we just described, so, you know, centralized trading, where you use it as a base currency, you know, in between, you know, when you're trading, call it in and out of, you know, other cryptocurrencies. And then, you know, for use in lending and borrowing and, and you know, taking leverage, levered positions. So, you know, example being, you know, I can lend somebody. So I have, you know, a stable coin, right? The way I earn 13 and a half percent yield is, is it's like being lent out to some and they're using that to then effectively purchase, you know, on borrow and, and, you know, make trades that have returns theoretically that are, you know, significantly higher than the API APY that I'm earning. The way that they might be earning that is, you know, price appreciation. They might be doing things like yield farming, meaning earning tokens and for different you know, participation and DeFi activities. But, you know, those yields, it'll be interesting to see you know, how long and sustainable right now, the yields are very attractive in many cases because new protocols are incentivizing, you know, folks to participate in the protocols by, you know, if you, if you stake a token, um, you know, which means like sort of lock it up and, and put it into a pool, it, you, basically you earn a significant amount of return for doing that. Right. And so many of these networks are incentivizing network participation and there's, Candidly, you know, in a fair right now, we're in a sideways market, but in a bullish market, there's usually a lack of like dollar liquidity. You know, everybody's like sort of long. And that's when you see these APYs like go through the roof. And that's when people kind of, you'll see significant stable coin issuance with people who maybe are a little more risk averse coming in and, and sort of saying, hey, I'll, I'll lend you my dollars so that you can then borrow them and, you know, earn these really juicy returns, you know, professional trader person. It's not for the faint of, part on the other side of the trade, but on this side where you're taking a stable coin and you know basically earning a, a yield, it, it's a little more secure. But I won't say, you know, I won't say it's riskless, right? So so you know what's great about blockchain and you know other other folks is is you know clearly denote you know basically that like it's not riskless to to earn these returns, right? Yep. Yeah an important point. And it's it's I think a lot of people are expecting over time yeah, yields to come down, but they've been up there for a couple of years now through various market cycles. And, and yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I think it's possible that there's like, it's a question, especially I, I think that yields will remain higher than people expect in crypto um, for a longer period of time than, than maybe people outside the ecosystem expect, mainly just because there are a incredible number of innovative protocols that people are actually using. And like, the number of people using existing protocols in the grand scheme of the world is low relative to how much you know activity there there will be and and i think is going to be and that's backed up by you know how much record levels of venture capital funding being raised and deployed you know that will be deployed into you know again the rewards that we were talking about that would encourage people to use protocols yep I want to talk about the partnership model a bit and and uh, you know where this is where you've had some incredible success you know providing infrastructure for some of the you know, biggest stable coins you mentioned. And yeah. and just tell us about kind of the strategy there and how these partnerships kind of work and you know from the Paxos side of things and kind of what's in it from the from the you know the, the side of the organizations you're partnering with. Yeah. So typically, you know it's a it's a big leap to go from you know being a call it a even if you're a fintech, even if you're a neobank, even if you're one of the most advanced companies and call it traditional asset classes, it's a big leap to add crypto products, you know, to your product portfolio. And, and we've seen companies that have done it natively like Robinhood and, you know, massive, massive teams. And it takes a significant amount of time and look, they've, they've done it, you know, well, clearly, you know, based on the financial, but that's not replicable for, for everyone, for every company, nor is it necessarily desirable. And, and so what we've seen is incredible demand for, uh, a couple of things. So the things that are hard are one, you know, getting the regulatory approval, which we worked so hard to do. So having, you know, the NYDFS and, and a national SEC bank charter, you know, these are things that, you know, they're not easy to acquire. And, and it took significant you know, demonstration over time of, of Paxos being able to deliver trusted products to, to maintain that and to you know, remain in great standing with regulators. So that's number one. Number two is, as I mentioned, you know, technically it's hard to you know find the engineering talent, the product talent to actually interact with blockchains, and then you know, and and so 
Paxos had the good fortune and, and fine liquidity and things of that nature. Paxos had the good fortune of having, a, you know, the original business was part of it was it bit our, our exchange, which is the liquidity source, you know, the white label crypto brokerage business that, you know, PayPal uses, Venmo uses, you know, Revolut uses, and, you know, a few other very significant global financial companies, you know, in the coming 12 to 18 months will be using. So, uh, the yeah so it's a mixture of that regulatory infrastructure the the technical infrastructure and then you know the market know-how and liquidity you know combined with the ability to scale so we proved with you know paypal that you can scale to you know significant levels we proved with binance that that we could scale to significant levels so that becomes a signal to the market that hey you know so so it's a pretty sure given that there's going to be a ton of companies looking for uh, a third party to help them you know, mm -hmm. stand up their various crypto businesses. And then those proof points that we've had with really large enterprise customers have ensured that you know, we're always in the consideration set. And also the good news about this market, it's just absolutely massive. Just like there are many, many payment processors that are humongous, you know, PayPal, Braintree, Stripe, Audion, you know, the traditional payments processors, there's going to be you know, more than one successful you know, crypto infrastructure provider, right? And and we could name others out there and, and there are a bunch of them. So so that's exciting, which means, you know, it's not a zero sum. It's it's a it's a really exciting market that's just getting started and already huge. Yeah. Well I, again I, I think you guys deserve a lot of credit and compliments for for getting the PayPals and the Revoluts and some of these big names into crypto. That's been hugely uh valuable for the whole ecosystem and uh a lot of kudos uh, are deserved there. If we could just talk now about, you know, stable coins and central bank digital currencies, you know, there's this kind of debate in the US and around the world about, you know, how much should this be CBDC, central bank digital currencies should be, you know, private sector driven, you know, Fed, Fed member quarrels seem to recently signal some support for leveraging the private sector and possibly leveraging stable coins like, you know, as an alternative to the Fed launching its own, you know, digital dollar. What do you think about kind of how stable coins and central bank digital currencies are going to evolve and play out in the, you know, the months and years to come? Great question. So it certainly will, you know, vary by region, right? So the Euro, mm -hmm. big news this morning, you know, moving forward to the next phase of, you know, kind of investigation and, and seemingly with a, you know, sort of mid-decade deadline of a, of a prospective launch if, if things go according to plan. Yeah, you know, China is already in, in the pilot phase of, of their central bank digital currency, but there's no one size fits all. So these things are very, very different one from another than you know fiat currencies are, right? Just in terms of you know the technology that can be brought to bear, in terms of how they're issued, you know, you know account-based versus other methods. And, you know, if they're issued directly, so, so let's just stick for now with, with the U.S., like as an example. So the U.S. is very early in the process of evaluating a central bank digital currency. It's considering, you know, numerous methods for if the U.S. were to move forward, you know, how these would be distributed from the central bank to, you know, the ultimate stakeholders, you know, consumers and businesses, you know, there are major questions, you know, would there, you know, would, would folks have, you know, direct accounts with the Fed? Will there be, you know, intermediate institutions, you know, like there are banks today that, that basically, you know, move money from the Fed out into, you know, circulation in the real economy? Unclear. My, my guess is, you know, look, but I'm always going to be biased is, you know, working at Paxos is that there's a, there's a high likelihood that that the government from a technology perspective or certainly yeah, if not the US government many governments will partner with infrastructure providers who you know are skilled at you know all the aspects of you know kind of again distribution settlement secure you know treasury management etc and you know account management wallet management there's just a tremendous number of things we're, we're going to see a really interesting microcosm of this play out in, in el salvador with this bitcoin rollout over over the coming months you know different than the central bank digital currency but just all the infrastructure that needs to be in place for you know a cryptocurrency or digitally issued you know piece of value to get from the government to, to individuals so an analogy an example of, of how this was done fairly well in some cases was like you know, the stimulus payments last year, which, you know, often went through like Square and went through, you know, PayPal and other, you know, fintechs, 
my, my, my guess is that if we do have a widely adopted CBDC or default CBDC in the United States, that there will be private institutions that will support. And then the question is, will they be the existing banks working with technology providers like a Paxos, you know, like a PayPal, like others, or, you know, will, will, will you know, we have accounts directly again with the Fed? Like, I would, I would probably say no, but I, like, it's just so early. And, but, but the ultimate you know, thing here that I think is critically important is that we think about, you know, like the trade-offs and, and the ability that a digital dollar, for example, you know, in China, for example, it's, it's frankly, it's, it's surveillance currency, right? You can see from the moment of, you know, creation to, you know, every, hop along the way, you know, and you see them cracking down on WeChat pay and Alipay. And you know, now the government effectively has a monopoly on information and there's you know, very little default, there's no default privacy. So the U.S. has a lot to think about as do other countries in terms of, you know, wallet anonymity, you know, maybe default, you know, privacy or pseudonymity, things of that nature. So a lot to work out, but I think these things, you know, might, sort of coexist. I don't think you're going to see hundreds of private stable coins, right? We're not going to be in a world where people are going to be like, I don't know, what's this thing? Is this a dollar? So I think that world never will exist. I think over the next decade, you're going to see a handful of dominant, you know, US dollar denominated stable coins, a handful of, you know, stable coins and other currencies. And then over time, a transition to CBDCs most likely, but with the you know, value and distribution chain and, and management chain and all of that, you know, involving private companies like Paxos. Awesome. Yeah. I was going to, as we were getting close to wrapping up, kind of ask for your kind of outlook and kind of where we are currently and, and, and what you're, you're looking for in the months and years to come. I know you're really excited about how big this can all get. Maybe you could speak to that. Yeah. So I, what I'm really excited about, I, I think we're going to see the same thing that happened with, with mobile payments, but just on a, you know, a really significantly larger and grander scale. And what happened with mobile payments is, you know, or e-commerce, you know, you just had people who could finally like buy things, you know, online, like using their computer. And it started with kind of like e-commerce. I input my credit card, I buy at a site, you know, then that happened on mobile and, you know, the, the, the method of payment, the economics didn't change. So I think, you know, but, but, the, but the methods changed and it became very easy. And it started with, again, e-commerce, digital goods on device. And now it's fun and fascinating. I mean, it's moving in store, right? So you tap to pay and it's easy and simple. And, and you know, now you're getting like QR code stuff and some of it's still rough, but like payments is easier than it used to be. Okay. I think, Crypto will take that form factor thing and you'll have the same ease, but, but what's going to be, and, and I think stablecoin adoption will actually start very similarly with, you know, digital goods and services, right? So people playing games like, you know, buying NBA top shot using a stable coin, which, you know, digital trading cards playing, you know, digital games, you know, and, and buying art and collectibles and eventually things like like social tokens, you know, buying in and out of them. And so there's just a tremendous number of really exciting emergent digitally native use cases. And it, they're going to, it's going to skew younger. And like, I might, I'm 42. I might not even know like how, how, you know, the kids are using money, right? It's just, it's just wild. And you're starting to see some of that with web three. And then, but I think then there are also critical mission critical and like life-saving and life-changing applications here that will also take foot really fast and are taking foot. Things like paying out people in countries where it's difficult to get banked and paying them in stablecoin that they can get to Bitcoin, Ethereum, getting people to take their paycheck in a country that has significant you know, val devaluation of a currency and immediately transfer that into a dollar denominated stablecoin. So I think like remittances, you know, payouts of marketplaces, you know, you know, call it like Clubhouse or Medium or Instacart or Uber, you know, or Lyft to like you know, drivers and other folks in, in different countries. It's going to be really exciting, lower cost, instant, and then, you know, easy and useful immediately in their wallets. So there's just some really exciting things happening there. And those are the use cases. Yeah, you know, I think there's going to be the fun use case and then like the like, accessibility use case. And those are going to be the two that are going to take this to a billion people, you know, faster than people think. Awesome. Well, that's, a, I think, a, a great note to wrap up on. Mike, where can people uh, go to learn more about Paxos and yourself? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we are, you know, www.paxos.com and we're at Paxos Global on Twitter and a lot of information about the company, our products, our partners, both those sites. And then I'm at M-D-U-D-A-S on Twitter. And I'm you know, constantly chatting about Paxos and, and just a lot of interesting things to me. You know, it's a constant, I think you know, what's so fun about the space is it's typically a constant journey of discovery. So a lot of the things that I'll talk about and that we'll talk about, you'll get so many comments and you learn, you know, through discourse. So, so I really hope that people do, you know, take up that conversation. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for joining us today. Thank you, Garrick. I really appreciate it.